Good morning. Good to be with you, dear folks. Welcome to Sunday School. I want us to start this morning in Ephesians chapter 4. Some of you have noticed that Brother Ellison, I don't know what it is, you just seem to be kind of glowing, you look happy or whatever, and you know, you know what it is, my wife has returned. So I'm thankful my wife, my sweet wife is back and my daughter is back from Argentina. It's uh, good to be together on this special day. I want to say happy Father's Day to all the dads here. What a blessing. Happy Father's Day. And uh, pray the Lord to give us encouragement this morning from His Word that we might have stronger families. I want to say this as you're opening your Bibles, Ephesians chapter 4. I want to start in Ephesians 4 and uh, then we'll continue uh, right on with, um, with our class here. We're talking about protecting yourself and your family from spiritual attack. All of us recognize we have a very active aggressive enemy, the devil. And we're in our notes there in your notebook. I hope everyone has a notebook this morning so you can just take notes along the way. But as we're getting started, I want to say just quickly, um, we will continue one more Sunday. So next week is when we'll actually finish the series, but we're glad you're here this morning. And I know on Father's Day, so many are traveling, people are visiting. Uh, it's kind of a difficult day to get it all together, but... Uh, the Lord is good, isn't He? Amen. He helps us. So welcome to Sunday School. Ephesians chapter 4, let's start there in verse 27. We'll read the verse. I'd like to just pray one more time and then just get right into uh, lesson number 5. All right, the Bible says, uh, Ephesians 4, 27, Neither give place to the devil. That's our enemy. Let's pray together. Father, we love you. Thank you for these moments in your word. Would you please come and teach us? You alone know us, dear God. Dear Father, you know us intimately. You know the needs of all of our families, of all of our children. And uh, we're looking to you. We recognize in faith you are enough to help us with these needs. So help us, Lord, not to, to uh, be deceived and look to other, other, other people or, or whatever, other things. Help us to look to you now. Come and teach us and speak to us. Your will be done. We ask, we're asking this together in Jesus' name. Amen. Very quickly here, you, you have in your notes, um, we're going to look at principles that help us to recognize and resist our enemy. We've looked at point number one already, the, the, the person and power of the enemy. We, we saw his names reveal his person. You have some of the names right there in your notes He's the devil, Revelations 12. He's the accuser of the brother, Revelations 12. He's the dragon. He's the serpent, Genesis 3. He's the God of this world, uh, 2 Corinthians 4. He's the enemy of our soul, Matthew chapter 13. He is a liar, John chapter 8. He is a murderer, John chapter 8. He is the tempter, Matthew 4. He's the unclean spirit, also in the parables of Matthew 13. He's Lucifer, Isaiah 14. We see in the scripture these names reveal his person, but then also we looked at the nefariousness reveals his power. Now, if you'll just remember quickly with me, Ephesians 4.27, the enemy is very powerful, but we recognize he's limited. The Bible says in Ephesians 4.27, neither give place to the devil. The word place is the word jurisdiction. Do not give the enemy jurisdiction in your life, in your family. God is admonishing us. This is a command. Neither give place. It's a command, right? We have to recognize the devil cannot possess what is already possessed by Jesus Christ. Amen. If you're a Christian, you are in Christ and Christ is in you. So what is the ideal of giving place? This is what I want to talk about. Obviously, in Ephesians 4, the context is Paul, the apostle, writing to the church at Ephesus, giving them this command, this imperative, do not give the opportunity to the enemy to deceive you, to take you down, to divide your heart, to destroy your testimony, to, 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 to destroy your life. But once again, he can't just come and take it. It has to be given to him. This is the idea. Don't give place to him. He can no longer just come and take control of my life. Why? Because I am in Christ. Amen. 
I am safe, I am secure, I am in Christ. But I can choose through my own volition to give him opportunity to bring his evil ways to pass in my life. That's why we see at times what we see. Uh, a person that is saved, but he has a, 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 his life, he has a ruinous life. Why? Because he's given place to the enemy. Are you thinking with me? I know it's early in the morning, right? So he can't just come and take us, take control of us and dominate our lives. No, 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 no. You as a Christian have to decide of your own will and volition to give him place. The devil cannot possess what has already been possessed by Jesus Christ, by the Holy Spirit. The Bible says if you're saved, we are sealed with the Holy Spirit until when? Until Christ comes, the day of redemption. Ephesians 4.30. Talking about security, we're not trying to keep ourselves with God. God is holding us in His hand. He has sealed us with the Holy Spirit. Right? So now let's talk about then, we've looked at His person and power, but His power is limited and it has something to do with decisions we make. But the question is, is how does he come and bring such influence into our lives that ultimately can bring us down a road of ruin? Let's look at the second point. <clears throat> Not only do we see in the text the person and power of the enemy, but we see the purpose of the enemy. Open your Bibles, John's Gospel, chapter, chapter 10. John chapter 10, verse 10. Very familiar scripture. I'm going to try to... Um, bring these, these principles to light. I hope it's not confusing to us. The purpose of the enemy, look at this. Jesus states the devil's agenda very clearly. John 10, 10. Look what the scripture says. The thief cometh not, but for, and here we see, Jesus is speaking of the enemy of our soul, the devil himself, as a thief. He comes and uh, becomes with purpose. What is his purpose? Number one, he's come to steal and to kill and to destroy. Amen. But look what Jesus said. I've come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Jesus doesn't just want to save us, though that's a beautiful thing, to be a Christian, to have assurance that after death you will stand in heaven in the very presence of God. That's wonderful. But Jesus said, I, I want you to have life, this forgiveness of your sins. But he says also, I want you to have life in abundance. Abundant life, a full life, a complete life. You say, is that possible? This side of heaven, of course it is. Amen. Jesus can change me, make me what I need to be. Jesus can change you and make you what you need to be. Right? Right? Life and life more abundantly. Now look at the, the purpose of the enemy. He's come to do number one, to steal. Look at this in your notes. He's come to rob from us. He will take from us, if we allow him, every resource given by God to ruin us, to, just, to, to, to take us out. He, he, he wants us to be convinced that somehow Jesus is not enough. We are empty-handed and have no means with which to protect ourselves or to walk in, in victory with God. Like uh, they would say in Spanish, no hay salida ni tampoco esperanza. He wants us to think there's no way out. There's, we're trapped. And so he's going to rob from us the resources that are ours in Christ. He's come to steal He's come to what? To kill. He not only wants to rob from us, he wants to ruin, he wants to run over us. He wants you to come to the place where you're thinking, you know, I'd be better off not here. I'm going to resign my life. You say Christians don't think that way. You need to study your Bible more. Amen. We see prophets of old. We see others that have come to the place where they are ready as a believer, a believing sinner, I, I, I want to resign my life. I, I'm just so discouraged. I mean, all of us, I think all of us, we're honest, we all get discouraged sometimes. Right? I get discouraged. And, and we, we, we get discouraged and we think, you know, there's just, this isn't working. Can I say to you, uh, be careful, be careful. The enemy is, is, is at work. He's active. He, 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 he's, come, he's come with purpose. Yes, his power is limited, Yes, in a real sense, he gains access to bring influence to our soul by permission. 
basically sin and confessed in our lives. We open our lives to his influence. But his agenda is very specific. Steal, kill, he robs from us. He wants to run over our lives and he wants to destroy us. He wants to ruin us. He wants to ruin every meaningful relationship given by God. Your marriage, your relationship to your children, our relationship to our children's children. You know, the enemy is very uh, active. And uh, there should be no surprise. Jesus is explaining to us his plan, his agenda. And uh, he's aggressive. How many would say... That's the truth right there. Amen to that. To steal, to kill, and to destroy. But Jesus says, I've come that you might have life and life more abundantly. Isn't it wonderful what we have in Christ? Isn't it wonderful to know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? Amen? Amen. Not only to have peace with God, but to have a real sense of of, of, uh, God is guiding my life. God is protecting my life. God has brought to me purpose and significance. I mean, I am in Christ. Christ is in me, right? I don't have to think like I used to think, live like I used to live. I don't have, have to continue in, in my, the, the, with the family life that I had or maybe I grew up with. Things can change. I would encourage you. Amen. Change is possible. You say, Brother Ellison, you don't know what's going on in our family, in our marriage. You're, well, you're right. You don't know what's going on in my family, my marriage. But you know God does, and He can help us, right. right? He can make this thing what ultimately would bring Him honor and glory. And so I want to encourage you. The enemy is active. Uh, we need to recognize His purpose and uh, to still kill and destroy But now stay with me, stay with me. We still haven't really addressed the question, how does he get an inroad? How does it happen? How does he come uh, with limited power? We're in Christ and yet somehow he has such seemingly at times, stay with me, authority in my life. The enemy. Let's look at point number three, the plan of the enemy. The plan of the enemy. Write that down. You say, what is his plan? And this is something we need to understand. The battle between God and the devil is the mind of men. Something we need to recognize as a Christian, as a believer, is that this is the battleground. This is at times where we win or lose the battle. This is where we open the door for the enemy to come and have such and wreak such havoc in our lives. You say, how does it happen, Brother Ellison? The battle between God and man is the mind of men. It's in your soul. It's in your soul. Look look, look at Ephesians 4 real quickly. Look at a couple of these scriptures with me. We won't won't study all of these, but uh, just we need to see... There, there is a basis for our thinking this morning. The Bible says in Ephesians 4, I love this, he's giving principles to, to bring about change that lasts. In Ephesians 4, he's talking about our walk with God, our fellowship with God. And in verses 22 to 24, he gives us principles to help us walk with God and to bring about lasting change to our lives. You say, how does that happen? Verse 23, this is one of the principles, be renewed in the spirit of your, what does it say? Your mind. There it is. It is in the plan of God that our mind be renewed, that our mind be changed. This is, God knows this is the battleground. We need to change the way we're thinking about God and life and meaning and marriage and love and sex and everything. Ephesians 4.27 says, again, you've seen that scripture, but neither give place to the enemy. One way we give him place is to drop the guard and to allow thoughts that come that find their base, their origin in him. I want you to think with me just for a moment. Every thought you think, 
is not from God. Somebody say amen to that right there. <laughs> Every thought you think is not from God. There are times we are thinking thoughts, and these thoughts begin to find expression in our lives if we're not careful. At times we're thinking thoughts that did not find their origin in God, or at times even in the flesh. You say, well, at times it's, it's just the flesh, right? Yes, it is. But at times it is the enemy. He is, he is planting thoughts in, uh, in our mind that eventually lead to action that results in a ruinous life. Another scripture, 2 Corinthians chapter 10. 2 Corinthians in chapter 10. The scripture says, verse 3. I made reference to it here in your notes. It says, for we walk in the flesh. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. We got to realize our battle, our battle is a spiritual battle. We're, we're working against an enemy that we cannot see or feel. You say, well, how in the world does he bring about such devastation Then, at times? It's in our thoughts. This is why the scripture says, verse 4, our weapons of warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of what? Strongholds. This idea of a stronghold is where we're allowing the enemy to have such influence and power in our lives through these strongholds. You say, well, what are these strongholds, Brother Ellison? Look at verse 5. We have words that give us indication that it has to do with our thought processes. Casting down what? Imaginations. This is up here. Every high thing that exalts itself against what? The knowledge of God. Imaginations, knowledge. Verse 5, bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Listen, every thought you think is not from God. The enemy at times is, is implanting ideas in your heart and mind. He may do that through different media, through, through be careful with, with internet, social media, Amen. Be careful with your closest friend. Be careful with things you're, uh, the, the, the things we listen to, expose ourselves to. It's, it's, they're trying to bring a perspective to us that is not founded in the Scripture or, in our, in our, or from God Himself. Everything, every thought you think is not from God. And that's why the Scripture says we need to bring these thoughts in, 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 in domination to control. Every imagination, everything that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, every thought to the obedience of Christ. Now, here's what we're building, the principle. The battle between God and Satan is the mind of men. You say, well, how does he even get the foothold? How does he get an inroad? Often it starts with lust in our hearts. There's the battle. Look at James chapter 4. I hope you're with me. Are you, are you with me? You thinking with me? James chapter 4. The whole context here is dealing with worldliness in the heart of a Christian. James chapter 4, dealing with worldliness. My, my sons and I, while my sweet wife was gone and Sarah was gone to Argentina, we did a little, a little study together as men and it's entitled Fight. So we, we walked around all day in the house with boxing gloves and all this. No, I'm just kidding. But the study was fight. That's what it was, fight. And we begin to see the root of the problems in our lives start, finds its, its origin in lust in our hearts. It, it says, from whence comes wars, James 4, 1, from whence comes wars and fightings among you, come they not hence even of your lust that war in your members. God help us not to try to justify our evil thinking and evil deeds. Justify them by blaming others, blaming our parents, blaming our, our uh, schools or blaming our society. Yes, all of that brings an influence. All, that, all these ideas, they bring an influence to us, but ultimately it's the lust in our members, these passions uncontrolled that go unchecked that begin to lead us down 
a ruinous past. You lust and have not, verse 2. Here's what I, me and the boys, we got three key words from our study on fight. Number one, lust, we begin to think, I want it. And that's our thinking, I want this. Uh, I'm, I, maybe God doesn't want us to have it, but I want it, right? And then after lust comes entitlement, we start thinking, I deserve it. The truth is, I deserve it. Because I, I'm a pretty good guy and all these other areas are in check and I, have, I, I deserve Maybe one area over here, and I keep it tucked away in my private world. I deserve it. Entitlement. And then that leads to real pride where we begin to think what? I can handle it. I can do this, and I will not receive the same consequences that everybody else receives by doing it. That my case is different. My situation's unique. You see, are you seeing how I'm thinking wrong? Yeah. Well, that's the enemy. That's the enemy. It started with this lust, but yes, but then he came and he begins to implant these ideas that, you know what, you deserve this. Brother Ellison, you're, you're a pretty good guy. I'm not a pretty good guy. My wife lives with me. Ask her. Wait till after the class service, you know, but ask her. And then this idea of pride is we, we, we think we can handle this situation. My case is unique and different. It will not bring the same results that we see. For an example in the scripture, me and the boys, we studied the life of Samson. Can I say to you, every thought you think is not from God. It's not in the notes, but note it real quickly, Matthew chapter 16. Let's go there. I just want to show you a biblical example. There are others. Matthew chapter 16. You remember the context? Write it in your notes. Matthew chapter 16 here Jesus is making that tremendous, um, uh, tremendous statement. He, he's asked the question. He said in verse 15, he saith to them, I'm in Matthew 16, 15. He saith unto them, his disciples, but whom say ye that I am? Jesus said, who do you think I am? And you remember the scripture. Simon Peter answered and said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Man, he got it right on. But look at this. That, that thought that went through his processes of reasoning and eventually came out of his mouth as a confession and declaration, Jesus identified the source. He said, you know, Peter, I know you thought you thought of that on your own and it all came out right and it was true. It is true. He said what? Verse 17, flesh and blood is not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. Jesus said, you know who gave you that thought? That, was, that, that found its beginnings in the Father. That declaration, that confession that went through your thought processes and ended up coming out of your mouth really was from God. <laughs> and then later on, you know, you know what happens in the same context. <laughs> Jesus is beginning to tell them that He's going to suffer many things. Verse 21, from that time forth began Jesus showing his disciples, verse 21, how he must go into Jerusalem, suffer many things of the elders, chief priests, and scribes, be killed, be raised again the third day. Then Peter took him, began to rebuke him. Now watch that. This is Peter now, the same one that just confessed. He's the Messiah. He's the Christ. He's now rebuking Jesus and saying, you're not going to die. That's not going to happen. And he rebuked him, saying, Be it far from me, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. Verse 23, but he turned and said unto Peter. Now Jesus is talking to Peter, and watch this. Jesus said, Get thee behind me, get thee behind me, Satan, thou art an offense unto me. Whoa. He's not saying, Peter, you're Satan. He's saying, Peter, the thing you just confessed came from another origin, another source. And it wasn't the Father this time. It was the devil. Are you thinking with me? Every thought you think, every thought I think is not from God. The battle between God and men and Satan is the mind of men. This is why the scripture exhorts us, renew your mind, right? Read the scripture. Spend time with God in prayer. Be faithful to Sunday school and preaching services. Fill your soul with truth. 
There is hope. The devil works out his plan of destruction by attacks on the mind. And, and this is, very quickly, watch this. Ephesians 4, 17, he darkens the mind. 2 Corinthians 4, 3, he blinds the mind. 2 Corinthians eleven three, 3, he corrupts the mind. The Bible says in Matthew 13, all those parables, seven parables uh, uh, about the kingdom of God and what's it like. And we always see the enemy showing up, right? Uh, trying to affect the seed, the thought planted by God. He perverts the mind. This is how he, this is how he works. This is what he's doing. This is why it's so careful. You know, when you say, well, how, how, how do I know if, if my thoughts are from God or not? This is where we need to spend time in the Scripture. Right? Spend time with God. But also, listen to me. If some of your thoughts are destructive and, and you know they're, you see the sources, I don't think this is of God. You need to identify that. Sometimes if there's thoughts you cannot shake... They're just bombarding you to do this, to do that. And you know this is not unto God. You, you better recognize that is the work of the enemy. And more than likely there are areas in your life, or in my life, where we're opening the door and giving him, giving him place to come and to build those strongholds in our soul. And God says, listen, you don't have to live that way. You don't have to think that way. You don't have to be, we don't have to be, brethren, defeated, discouraged, depressed Christians. Are you with me? Look at this to encourage our heart. Number four, the protection from the enemy. You say, Brother Ellison, is there hope? I mean, how do we, uh, th this battle is going on. It's pretty intense in my family. It's affecting my marriage. It's affecting my relationship to my kids. It's affecting my, my fellowship with God. What, what, what can I, what is good to do? Well, realize number one, <laughs> there is protection in Christ, right? Christ's death and resurrection assures the victory to every believing sinner. Look at Colossians with me. Would you do that? Colossians in chapter 2. Colossians in chapter 2. Paul is reminding the church of Colossians. He says, listen, um, he's dealing with a lot of false teaching and we don't have time to do with all the context, but Paul the apostle is writing this church because false teachers have come in and, and they're... They're like the, the Jehovah Witnesses. They're like the Mormons. They're like other cults. They come in and use Christian vocabulary, but with different definitions. And so they come in with enticing words, the Bible says. Look, look verse 4. And this I say, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. Boy, they're, they're so creative with their vocabulary. They're so penetrating with their, with, their, with their words. It sounds so right, but it's so wrong. <laughs> Be careful. He, he, he says, verse 6, As you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in Him, rooted and built up in Him, established in the faith, as you've been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Paul is reminding them, you are in Christ. You are built up and established in Him. He's your refuge. Uh, don't let anything take you away from the simplicity that is in Christ. I love this in verse 10. He says, Ye are complete in Him, which is the head of all principality and power. Think about that right there. The devil in all of his ranks of authority and, and influence and limited, it's limited power, but he has authority. And he comes and, 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 and Paul is reminding the church, he's reminding us, listen, you're in Christ. You are complete in him. You lack nothing. As a matter of fact, he is the head of every principality and power. But I like what it says here. <clears throat> He says, be careful, beware, verse 8, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men. That's what's happening. 
people are coming to us and they make a greater emphasis and, and importance on traditions of men, the commandments of men, the things of the church instead of simple, pure, like we studied last week, unfeigned faith in Christ. Christ is enough. Verse 15 tells us why. Look at verse 15. Just go ahead and jot down there to verse 15. Having spoiled principalities and power, he made a show of them openly, triumphant over them in it. Look, look, look what happened. Look what Jesus did for us. Look at this. The devil has been disarmed. That's the word spoiled. Having spoiled principalities and powers. Think about that. Once again, the enemy just cannot come and take you out. The enemy cannot just come and dominate your life and possess your soul. No, 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 no. He cannot possess what is possessed by Jesus Christ. He's been spoiled. He has been disarmed. He has also been defamed. Show of them openly. Verse 15 again. He's been defamed. He, he comes sometimes and, and he, he tries to present himself like he's so powerful and so wise and so capable of taking us out. He can't. He's disarmed. He's defamed. He is what? Defeated. Look at this. Triumphing, do you say? Triumphing over them in it. Our faith in Christ, the simplicity of Christ is enough. If you are truly a Christian, the enemy cannot just come and dominate your life. That's good news, isn't it? We are in the Lord. <clears throat> the protection from the enemy is in Christ. It's in Christ. That's why the Bible talks so much about being in Christ, right? There are people that are good people. There are people that are sincere. There are people that are religious but not saved. There are people that have a knowledge of God, but it's right here. And it's never been translated down to a heart relationship with God. Be careful. The Bible says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Amen. The word believe in the Bible is the ideal of, 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 uh, of, uh, of confidence and trust in Christ and Christ alone for your salvation. We're not trusting our good works, our good behavior, our best intentions, our baptism, our communion, or whatever. We're either trusting Christ and what he did on the cross of Calvary where he shed his blood, suffered, was buried and rose again and victorious in resurrection. We're trusting what he's done or we are not a Christian. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. The protection from the enemy only comes from a right relationship with Christ. And then we grow in that relationship. We hear Pastor Miller say that all the time. We need to grow in our walk in relationship with Christ. There it is. Is that maybe why there, there, there are Christians that are so defeated, discouraged, depressed? Because they've opened, they themselves are giving place to the enemy. The battle between God and Satan is the mind of men. Every thought you think is not from God. Your mind must, my mind, your, our mind must be renewed, right? Watch this. Four quick things, very quickly. This protection is ours by four things. I'm going to close with that this morning. This spiritual protection is available to us right now, right now. You say, how? Number one, humbling ourselves before God. There it is. Humbling ourselves before God. Do you, do you, you know what, you know what the essence of prayer is? It's our expression of daily dependence upon God. Is there still pride in your heart? Is there still this attitude that you can make this happen, you can work this out, you can handle this? Humbling yourself. This is where the scripture says, right? Uh, he giveth more grace, wherefore he saith, I'm in James 4, God resisteth the proud, giveth grace unto the humble. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil. By the way, you, know, you cannot resist the devil until we're submitted to God. The word submit is a military term which says Get in line. Get in proper rank. 
align yourself where it needs to be in your relationship with God. Humbling ourselves before God. There's the key. Draw near to God. He'll draw near to you. I love it. I love it. Verse 10, humble yourselves in the sight of God. He will lift you up. Who is the one that can change what's going on in our marriages, in our families, in our children's children? It is the living God, folks. No, no measure of education and training. and You can go to a thousand conferences, but if we don't get back to this relationship with God, except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. How many of you have heard that? That's Psalm 127. Except the Lord build the house. Humbling yourselves before God. There it is. Number two, confessing to God any and all involvement in sin. The word confess, we find it in 1 John chapter 1, uh, verse 9. The scripture says, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The word confess is the idea that we, 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 we name our sin what God calls it. Lie, lust, adultery, fornication, drunkenness, sodomy, whatever. We confess this thing, God, I agree with you. The idea of confession is we're agreeing with God with what is wrong in our life. He said that's wrong and we agree with him about it. He convinces us by the Holy Spirit and we humble ourselves and confess our involvement in that thing. Confessing to God any and all involvement in sin. Young person and adults, be careful what you see on social media, what you open your eyes to, the eye gate to, which affects everything. Be careful. The enemy is always looking for ways, right, to, to attack us. I, I know in my, in my, I've noticed in my, in my email, one day I was talking to my son-in-law, Josue, yeah? They're coming over for Father's Day, man. When there's food, everybody... No, I'm just kidding. Okay, he's coming over. And, and I was asked, I said, what's, I said, what's all this spam stuff? And he told me, he said, he said, Dad, don't ever open anything that's spam. It's usually something crazy. It's something you shouldn't see anyway, whatever. Just always once a week, once a week, once a month, just go to spam and say, delete all spam. And, and that's the truth. So much that just comes... I'm not looking for that stuff. I'm not participating in this. But it's sitting there in my spam box. Well, who sent it there? Well, the enemy himself. God says, be careful. We need to confess to God any and all involvement. There is no hope for you if you do not confess your sins. Amen. Amen. You get back to this, this idea of lust, entitlement, and pride, remember? Lust says, I want this. Entitlement says, I really deserve this, really, this one area. And then pride says, my case is so unique and different, I will not suffer the consequences that normally come because of this sin. And so in pride, we give our, the members of our, our body to this thing. God says, listen, you, you keep thinking that way, you're going to lose everything that's precious. Confession. There's a third area, very quickly, asking Christ to restore our soul. We've already seen who it is. Who is it that has defamed, right? Who is it that has uh, disarmed and defeated the enemy? It's Christ. Who is the, that is the head of all principality and power? It's Christ. The Bible says in Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. and goes on to talk about how he restoreth our soul. Can I encourage you to, uh, that's what we all need to do is run to Jesus. Lord, help me with these thoughts. Help me with these habits, with these vices. Uh, God, I humble myself. I can't handle it. I'm looking to you, Christ. And we, we call out to him. He's the one that can establish our homes in the truth, in the right way. Amen. Asking Christ. Ask it. I'm thinking of Jude. You, know, you remember in Jude where, um, uh, where uh, I'm thinking this of the scripture here, Jude, where 
the, the Bible says, look at Jude verse 9. It's not on your notes, it just came to me, but Jude chapter, and verse 9, verse 9 of Jude. Yet Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, does not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, the Lord rebuked thee. Watch that. This archangel, instead of him just confronting the enemy himself, he said, the Lord rebuke you. Can I say to you, your authority is in Christ. There are people that say, now wait a minute, wait a minute. I have authority to rebuke the enemy. I guess in one sense because you're in Christ you do. But listen, you need to humble yourself and run to Christ. And say, Jesus, will you just drive back these influences? Jesus, would you just remove these lies? Jesus, would you help me to recognize and resist there are some Christians, even spiritually speaking, have so much pride. Hey, hey devil, I come against you right now. I have authority. I, I, I'm going to do this. Listen, you need to, why, why don't we learn from uh, Michael the archangel talking about power and authority. He said, the Lord rebuke you. Listen, Jesus is your help and your authority. You need to run to Christ. I need to run to Christ. The last thing here to help us had the spirit is staying close to Christ and his church. You know, there are actually Christians who think they can really have a successful Christian life without submitting themselves to authority of a local church, without giving themselves to fellowship with Christ on a regular basis. They think somehow they can journey in this life and be successful and be fruitful in their knowledge of Christ without really putting forth any effort to meet God. That does not happen. John 15, the, the, the key word is the word abide. In, in, el, in el español es la, es la palabra permanecer. That word abide occurs some 10 times in, in John 15. The ideal is as a Christian, there will be no fruit bearing without abiding. There will be, there will be nothing lasting and meaningful and significant through our lives if we're not staying close to Christ and to his church. They kind of go together, right? These are decisions for, these are steps, they're for, I, I think are key, that will help us to recognize and, yea, resist our enemy, the devil. Humbling ourselves before God, confessing to God any and all involvement in sin, asking Christ to restore our soul, staying close to Christ. Jesus said in John 15, 5, for without me, what did he say? You can do nothing. We need to abide in Christ, stay close to Him, close to His church and fellowship with the believers. I just found my notes. I set them over here. <laughs> Can I say something to you real quick? I want us to pray for each other because I know the enemy hates our families. How many would say amen to that right there? He hates our marriages. He doesn't want us to be fulfilled and happy and content. He doesn't want our children to be spiritual and walk with God. He doesn't want us to have fellowship that we should be having because we are in Christ. He's looking for every way to penetrate and to come into our homes and wreak havoc. There is hope. Amen? And there is a way out that we have to decide. Let's pray together. Let's do this. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name we come, thanking you for what we have in you. Jesus, you are the head of all principality and power. Thank you for saving us, for forgiving us, for offering to us life in abundance, life more abundantly. Help us to decide in our own hearts right now to humble ourselves before you, to confess our sins, Lord, to confess these things to you, to really trust you, to lean and depend on you, to restore our soul, to, tear, to help us tear down these strongholds, these thoughts, because all of our thoughts have not their origin in God. Help us, Lord, to stay close to you and to your church. We need your help. We acknowledge it now together. Our families, we need your help in our marriages, in our homes. We are lost and empty without you. 
Our heads are still bowed, our eyes are closed. We're in an attitude of prayer. How many of you here this morning, you'd say, you know, Brother Ellison, I see, I see the truth. I, I realize the enemy is at work against my marriage and against my children. And I'm making steps today. Pray for me, Brother Ellison. I'm making decisions right now in my heart. He's, God has put his finger on a couple things in my life I need to deal with. Pray for me. Pray for me. Would you just raise your hand real high? Bless your heart. God bless you. Amen. Glory to God. Father, thank you for these precious, precious Christians. Thank you for every family represented in this study. Continue to do a deep, abiding work in our lives. Bless them, help them, guide them. We're asking this together in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. God bless you. I look forward to one more session together next.